A year ago, the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus was fortunate enough to be able to purchase a building in San Francisco. We wanted it to be the home of the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus, but we wanted to do so much more. And so we have begun, we launched the National LGBTQ Center for the Arts. Our programming was to launch, well, it actually did launch this February of 2020 with a, a behind the curtain with the cast of Hamilton. That was the only one that we were able to, to complete because of the coronavirus. So now we're creating these moments online behind the curtain with some of our very favorite friends and people that will inspire and delight and humor us. And who better than that than <laughs> Billy Porter? Welcome, Billy. Hi, everybody. How hey. y'all doing? Hi. <laughs> you are so subtle. I love it. <laughs> okay, listen, I have to explain these glasses. Okay. I don't walk around <laughs> wearing these glasses all the time. I got a new prescription right before the Oscars and my stylist took two frames and bejeweled them for the look. Yes. When I got back, I, then I went immediately to London. When I got back, it was coronavirus. Mm. So the only glasses that I can <laughs> see out of are the bejeweled ones. Yes. <laughs> Love this. <laughs> Oh my God. So I'm walking around with these bejeweled glasses. There's a, there, 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 an, a, another pair that's about this big. But they're the ones I can see the best out of. <laughs> well, they're they're fabulous, of course. From you know, you're seeing beautifully out of the glasses, and what we're seeing is amazing. So <laughs> please don't apologize and wear them forever. And when you can see, no more. I want them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll send you my address. You know, we, speaking of the Oscars, uh, yes. you performed at the Oscars. Uh, yes. Yes, that was brilliant. Um, tell us how. Uh, tell us about that, and also tell us, you know, what your Oscar role, what what your dream Oscar role is, because that's all you're missing in the EGOT. Well, okay, the whole Oscar thing is like I don't even know where to begin because last year, 2019, when all that Kevin Hart stuff went down there was a list that was compiled by like BuzzFeed or something. And they were like, and it was like top 10 people to host the Oscars. And I was on that list. I was like, let's not get ahead of ourselves, children. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, but please. And there were a couple of people around me going, oh, you're going to be at the Oscars this year. You're going to be at the Oscars. And I was like, there's no reason for me to be at the Oscars. Like I'm in television. Ring-a-ling-a-ling-a-ling. <laughs> Two weeks before the Oscars, ABC calls and they said, would you host the red carpet? And it was just like, well, yeah. And, you know, I had seen Adina Menzel a few years prior, right? Mm -hmm. For Frozen. And John Travolta said her name wrong. And I remember watching. And as a businessman, I was like, I need somebody to say my name wrong on the Oscars. Because yeah. I will be a household name in <laughs> 24 yeah. hours. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, metaphorically. Right. Yeah. So when this came up, it was like I was ready for it because I understood the magnitude of the audience. I understand the magnitude. If that's show business Super Bowl, it's like that's the hugest audience for anything, really. Right. Televised on television. So I happened to be uh, at the fashion week for the first time in New York and I was at Christian Siriano and I just thought I always joked about wearing a gown I always joked with my friends about wearing gowns or wearing you know just wearing something a gown or something other than a tux to the Oscars this is the time I went to Christian I told him the idea he was like yes so that's where it started two weeks yeah, we had two weeks. So then this year, they invited me back to host the red carpet. And we were getting ready for that. And then, like, once again, like two weeks before, <laughs> I get a call from Janelle Monet's people. And, she, and they're like, um, Janelle wants you to be in her opening number for the Oscars. And I was like, wait, be on the Oscars, like performing. <laughs> so that's how that happened. Wow. You know, and 
there were lots of angels in my life. I've had lots of angels watching over me in my life. And every single time it's like, you know, there was Taylor Swift who called me to be in her video. You know, there's Janelle Monet. I'm like, oh, they're reaching back to get grandpa. I tease, <laughs> but I really am grandpa okay. with those with those girls. Yeah. You know, and like, you know, pulling me pulling me up, lifting me up in a way and, and putting me in a space that I have never had the opportunity to vibrate in. Um, it was very special. It was a very special moment. Yeah. The fact that I was able to sing, I'm still standing. Yeah. You know, those words resonate with me because I've lived it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sir Elton John literally just reached out to me yesterday. Wow. I have spoken to him on the phone two days in a row. <laughs> nice. Wow. Because, because he's off of the tour because of the coronavirus, he's been binging Pose. Oh. Because he hadn't seen Pose. Nice. So he's living the full two seasons now. <laughs> Love that. And yeah, you, had, it, you, had, uh, you put one in the can, right? For season three. Well, almost. We're like a day away from finishing the first episode of season three. Well, well, that will happen again. Yes. And, sure. yeah, um, yeah, I, I wanted to say, um, because I think, first of all, you broke the internet in 2019 with that gown. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it was fabulous and amazing. But also, what you did for so many of us, it was as if you gave so many of us permission. Oh, it, it, oh yeah. you did. Yeah. You did. You said, go oh. out there, be fabulous, be outrageous, be yourself, be authentic, be inspiring. You know, and there was a shift in the community. And I, yeah. I applaud you for that. Oh, yeah. thank you. I, you know, I have to say that it's been a long road for me. Black don't crack and people really don't realize how old I, I actually am. I turned 50 the day before the Emmys. I've been in this business for over 30 years. There have been a lot of ups and there have been a lot of downs and there have been a lot of in-betweens, you know? And I am so grateful that all of this is happening at this right. point yeah. in time in my life. You know, like I never, I'm so grateful that, I've, that I lived to see the day where someone like me can be where I am. It was not this 30 years ago. I could not be this 30 years ago. Right. There was not a space for me. My generation created this space. The ones who came before us created the space where, I, where we could push it forward. And now we're continuing to push it forward. We're continuing to pay it forward. We must, we must. And, and I, you know, it's very intentional with me. Um, I am very aware of the platform and I'm old enough and seasoned enough to know how to use it. Right, well, I, I, I wanna say about, about you, you know, others have been given these kinds of opportunities and mantles. You are in the perfect place to be our role model and our representative. And part of that is because, you know, you're just living into it, exactly what you said, and with such humility and grace that it, you are an incredible role model. For oh, thank you. And, and many, many will look back and, and list Billy Porter as that person that changed their lives. Oh, them on, oh there's no, no question about it. Uh, I read that you were 50. You, it's in print. So yes. know, it's, not, it's not a big no, secret. I don't lie about it. <laughs> I don't lie about it because I worked too hard for it. No kidding. Um, <laughs> and there are a lot of people who didn't make it to this. Absolutely. You know, there are a lot of my friends who didn't make it to this. So I'm screaming it from the rooftop. Me too. The, um, I did hear that there might be yoga in your 50-year-old future. How's that going for you? Yeah, well, we, we're out here. At, you know, we, we, we rented this house. I don't really, you know, 
it's very 1%, you know, it's very much the 1%. So I'm not trying to like, you know, I'm very grateful. I'm very, you know, I'm very lucky. We're very blessed to have this space. Um, And I'm just trying to understand what self-care means. Mm. That's not something that I've ever had the luxury to sort of lean into. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I've been writing and directing for about 20 years behind the scenes. You know, this is the first time as a writer that I've been able to sort of wake up every day and just write without worrying about how I'm going to eat. Um, or the flip side of that, having to get to a curtain, you know, at 8 p.m. I mean, my play, uh, While I Yet Live, debuted off Broadway in 2014. And I was in rehearsals during the day doing rewrites on the, you know, on our feet and then getting to my curtain at 7.30 every night. You know, so this is really the first time that I've been able to just write. Now, we got Corona, 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 she better don't virus (laughs) on our brains. But I am finding this space that feels really creative and inside of that creativity I feel empowered. Yeah. So that's great. It is. There are some real positives. Um, Laura Bonanti the other day said um, she feels like the universe is just saying, go to your room and think about about what you've done. Just go to your room. It's time out. It's a global reset. It is. uh, It's a global reset. Yep. This, this shit don't have no respect of persons. Yep. We can listen or not right. to our, at our own peril because we see what it does when we don't listen. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. I, have a, I have a question. Yes. Um, when was the first time you performed ever? When was the first time I performed in church? Uh-huh. No, uh, yeah. I, I guess sang in church? Yeah. I was probably four or five and I sang my first solo in church. Did you sing, did your parents or... Um, did your parents have, have you sing for guests and fa- family and friends before that? No, not really. It was all, it, well, well, the guests and the family and friends were in church. They were the church. That was church. That was church. What's the first song you remember? Jesus Loves Me. Mm. Uh, a standard. Yeah. Yes. For sure. And, and, so, one, and a lyric that we all need to remember. Right. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> There's that. Because, you know, the conservatives, like, the first thing the conservatives like to do is take Jesus and God away from the gays. For sure. He ain't y'all's to take. Right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so after the, the church, um, of course, I know the amazing uh, experiences you had in your education and all of that. But when did that morph from church to something that was no longer church? How did that happen? Well, I got bust during like desegregation for the second time in 1980, <clears throat> right? Fall of 80, I went into middle school. So I got bust and it was right as Reagan was, it was the year Reagan was um, elected. So the government still cared about public education It was before they started stripping all of that away from us. And there were after school programs that were free. There was a book about this thick, front and back, that were after school programs at my school alone. It was like the after school program was like everybody just stayed. Wow. Nobody went home. The whole school stayed and did something else. You know, it was beautiful. And so they had Risenstein Musical Theater. I didn't know what a musical was, but I figured I could sing. And so I went and they, Betsy Schmidt uh, explained what a musical was. Um, And we were doing Rogers and Hart's, uh, oh shoot, Babes in Arms. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And we were to come back the following week and just sing a song. Everybody would get cast. Everybody would be double cast. (laughs) Everybody. And we're talking hundreds of people at this point. (laughs) At least, at least a hundred people in the show. At least. So, interestingly enough, that very day was my birthday. September 21st, it was my birthday. And my grandmother and my great aunt came to pick me up, surprised me, took me downtown. We had dinner. And then we went to Heinz Hall in downtown Pittsburgh to see the touring company of The Wiz. Oh, my goodness. And I was like, wait, (laughs) this is a musical. (laughs) This is what she was just talking about. Like, this is a musical. I felt, obviously, I fell in love with the music. You know, because it was my music. It was right. speaking to me. It was R&B, soul music. She sings home at the end of the show. I'm a mess. I'm a wreck. Like, they had to carry me to the car. I get into music class the next day, and I tell my music teacher, I just saw The Wiz last night. I want to sing this song called Home, but I don't know how to get the music, and I don't really know. Like, what could I do? And, like, two days later... This woman had purchased, Rhoda Arnold is her name. She had purchased the sheet music and the cast album for me. I took it home. I learned home. I came the next week. I sang home. The cast list went up the following week. Everybody was double cast. And then I see my name. And it said, Gus Fielding, Billy Porter, and nobody else. Woo-hoo. And wow. for a person who had been bullied, at, you know, extreme bullying, because I wasn't good at sports, and I, it just was a sign that, like, oh, wait, am I good at this? Like, this might be something I'm good at. Let me lean into it. And so then, you know, rehearsals, We did all of that. I loved it. But it never occurred to me that it would be something that I could do for a living until seeing the Tony Awards. Hmm. And that year it was Dreamgirls. Oh, my goodness. And so I was in my kitchen washing dishes and the Tony Awards come on. And I don't even know what the Tony Awards are. And then (laughs) they're introduced and they launch into the fight scene. And all of a sudden, Jennifer Holliday is singing like I'm singing in church. And, you know, I didn't make the connection because Rogers and Hart is not gospel. So I didn't make the connection that, you know, I was a gospel. I was in church. Like I didn't. And even seeing the whiz, I didn't make the connection that people got paid to do that. Even though it was theater, the light bulb went off because they were on television. I was seeing it through the lens of a television. And at 11 years old, that's what I understood. When you're on TV, you make money. Right. And so that was the change. That was the shift. And that was, that was the bite. I got bit wow. and, I, and I've not gone back ever since. Rhoda Arnold and Betsy Schmidt. Thank you. Thank you, Rhoda and Betsy. They were the two, at the very two first ones. And then obviously there's a lot that comes after that. Right. This is impossible. There are so many questions I want to ask you. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, And I just adore you. And I I have had the pleasure of seeing you honored at various events um, and and hearing you speak in person um, and that authenticity and and, how you share you know, in such a vulnerable way about your journey. Um, and, you know, it allows us all to, to kind of step into our own authenticity. And I, again, I just want to acknowledge you for that. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I'm curious, uh, you know, season three of Pose, uh, mm-hmm. we're, I mean, it's one of the best shows on TV. Uh, you know, I, I cry so much um and and yet i'm also lifted you know i i think we all are you know that way um but you know i'm sure you've learned so many lessons in this process with pose but uh, share one with us that like stands out for you or or an experience um that you really have taken away from pose to dream the impossible Mm. 
I have always had big dreams. Always, always, always. Huge, huge dreams. And even inside of that, because they were springboarded off of stuff I had already seen, I was never dreaming something that I hadn't seen. Mm. So for the first 20 plus years of my career, 20 years I'll say, consciously, Mm. I was trying to fit in to a paradigm that I was told was the only way. And there was nothing reflected back at me that told me otherwise. You know, if you're not masculine enough by society standards, you will not work, you black faggot you. That's what I was told. That was the messaging and that was the truth for a very, very long time. And I'm not talking about working. I'm talking about, you know, cause I worked. I, I'm talking about what I'm doing right now, what has existed from, what has happened to me, the way the world gets to see me now, you know, that was not possible. Mm. I never saw it, you know, I mean, even until, you know, I mean, I look at, I watch Pose myself and just, I have no words. It's like, what a, what a gift. What a gift. It's like, it's not often. And I'm speaking of myself in this trailblazing way because other people have said it. I'm owning it. I'm a part of the generation that blazed the trail for what we're seeing now. I'm a part of that generation. It's not often that the trailblazer, the one who kicks the door down, gets to walk through it and receive the glory from having the door been kicked open and down. It's not lost on me that I am in, that I'm both of those things. You know, it's like I lived my life with a void, an empty void. Mm. There was never anything that looked back at me. Not never. There were, you know, James Baldwin, Langston Hughes, you know, yes, 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 yes. There were very few. And even when the door was being kicked down vis-a-vis a will and grace. Where were the people of color in that? Where were we? Where were we? Still today, with the revival of it, where are we? Not a read, it's just a different story. (laughs) It's a different story and I am grateful to have had the obstacles that I had because it made me go deeper inside of my creativity. It made me ask different questions. It turned me into a different kind of artist that I don't know that I would have been, that I would be, had that that challenge those challenges not existed for me. You know, yes, I had to fight. I had to fight my ass off. I still fight. But I am so rich because of it. You know, my soul is enriched, my spirit is enriched, and therefore I can give and I can share creatively. This is a ministry for me. I'm so glad you segued quickly into into this being your ministry, um, because I have a question about that. I also was a a minister of music in a church and grew up much like you, singing all the time, all of that. And then I came out. And um, so my question for you is, when you you were taught in the church that your singing was a ministry, 
And then when you come out, there's that separation from the church that you knew or the certain church that you had loved. When did you realize that your activism is actually a ministry? How did that come together? Hmm. I was probably 17 when I lost my first friend to AIDS. Hmm. And I was already, you know, I already had, I was already on my way out. But I just got sick of hearing from these pulpits that AIDS was God's punishment. Mm. It's like, you know what? What you're saying from this bully pulpit is exactly the opposite of what the Bible actually says. It's the opposite of what Jesus actually did. And you have no idea who this person is that I just lost. So I'm done. I'm done with that. I'm done with the hypocrisy. And you know, it had, I had also lived through, you know, sexual abuse and nobody doing anything about it. And you know, like I had lived through a bunch of shit at that point where I was like, y'all are full of shit. And I'm not having any of it. And until that changes, I'm done. <laughs> and I'm gonna go and I'm gonna work in the vineyard, <laughs> if you will, where actual work is getting done. We're real, Jesus work is getting done for me, for me. And I actually get to choose what that looks like and what that is. So I was probably, you know, 16, 17, when I sort of made that split and understood that my entire being and everything that I stand for is my ministry, mm -hmm. all of it. You know, it's like they crucified Jesus, y'all, remember? He was crucified for what he stood for. He was crucified. So it should be no surprise <laughs> to anybody that I'm misunderstood, you know? <laughs> Right. <laughs> it's like my mama said, my mama used to say, they crucified Jesus, boy, you'll be fine. You know, like. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> I'm working on that in therapy right now. But that is, yeah. That's the best. You know what I mean? It's funny, but it's also like. Yeah. You know, wow. it's true. It's funny. But like. Right. You know, it's like when, when, our, when, when I hear things about. You know, some of our leaders, oh, we're better than this. Our country is better than this. It's like, we are not, nor have we ever been better than this. No. No. We tried. We have tried. But this is a country built on slavery, period. What are you talking about? Why is, are any of us surprised? That Orangina 45 is has his highest ratings right now. Why is anybody fucking surprised by that? Right. Yeah. Preach it. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Preach. I mean, I, I, I can't follow up to that because we all share that exact sentiment. I mean, it, yeah, we should Of course he is. Of course yeah. he is because this is the backlash for having a black president. How the fuck did that happen? And that is never happening again. Yeah. That will never happen again. That's what the Senate has let us know. That's what all his cronies have let us know. Every single one of those motherfuckers, we know exactly where they stand. And I am grateful for that. Because we had moved so far away from it because of, you know, uh, being politically correct. Now we know. Show me who you are for real and they have shown us 
who they are for real. So what are we going to do? Are we going to be better than this? Collectively, are we? We'll see in November. Well, we will see in November. You know, the, the great thing for me is seeing people like you. And uh, in, in the midst of all of this anger and frustration and uh, well-deserved, we, we have. And yet um, you spend your life lifting people up. And I try to. Oh, you do. Oh, you do. Uh, I try to. <laughs> about that. You have, I, I conduct a lot of songs, lots of songs with lots of people. And people go, oh, what's your favorite song? And I'm like, I could never say that because they're my children. Yeah. They, they come and go, but they it's like a family. They come and go, and I love these the best when we're performing. Right now. However, yeah. I'm going to ask you a, a, a hard question. It's not your favorite song, but when was there a moment and, and where where was it when you realized all the things that you've been saying that your life had come together? And indeed, the this piece that you're singing is changing people's lives or your own life or three people. It doesn't have to be worldwide. But do you remember a moment when you thought, wow, this is really what I need to be doing. This is the song I need to be singing. Well, I wrote a song called Time. And I, a friend of mine had passed away. It was 1994, 95. And, you know, one of the countless numbers of people that had passed away, but this one, this one was really close to me. Actually, his, he was from San Francisco. Um, and we worked together uh, as understudies in Five Guys Named Mo. And I wrote this lyric, or no, I didn't write a lyric, I wrote this poem. And I sort of passed it around to different songwriter friends of mine. And nobody would do it. Nobody would help me. Cause I don't really play an instrument. I played the saxophone for a long time, but I don't, but I don't play like that. So I need help. So it was around 2000. So I sat on it for probably like five, six years. And then like 2001, I was in LA and I had a songwriting session. Um, and this guy named Brian Steckler we were put together and we were writing something else. And there were two songs that it had, had inspired it. Um, Rochelle Farrell's Peace on Earth mm -hmm. and Layla Hathaway's So They Say. And I wanted a song like that. And so I'd written this lyric with that in mind. So I gave this lyric to Brian and I didn't hear from him. Then a couple of weeks later, he said, come over to the studio. I have like a, a figure I want to play you. And he played it for me. And we wrote the song in like 10 minutes. And he said, I have to, t and I had told him, I said, I've given, I had given this to several of my friends and nobody would, you know, there was no response. So I didn't think it was any good. And he said, I wasn't going to do it either. Because the lyric is so profound and it's so personal that it almost feels, I didn't feel like I could do it justice. And it was my wife that said, that saw it sitting on the piano and said, you must write this with this boy, with this man. So, that was a moment where I began to understand the power that I could have as a creator. You know, because I'm the last of a generation that was taught to be brilliant interpreters of other people's material. This yeah. was pre-internet, this was pre-do-it-yourself, this was pre-all of that. So I didn't really start writing until I was in my 30s. I didn't really start I didn't even know it was really an option until I was in my 30s. 
you know, so this was the moment where it was like, okay. Um, so yeah, it was my song time. Wonderful. I, I love that. Did you record it? Yeah, it's on um, at the corner of Broadway and Soul. Okay. It's on that album. And it was, it, was a, it was a featured song on So You Think You Can Dance. Mia Michaels, I don't know if you ever, ever saw that. Oh, yeah. yeah, of course. So Mia Michaels did the flower dance about her father passing away. That's oh. time. Oh, That's my, my song. That's the one I wrote. Oh, my mm. goodness. Mm. Oh. Awesome. Oh. So last thing, you're writing your memoir. Yes, I am. What does it say? What does it say? <laughs> Give us the inside scoop. <laughs> well, you know, I, I sold it pre-pose um, airing. I sold it pre-pose. Wow. So it was sort of, it was sort of, um, it was pre-pose. So now I am, um, it's really the whole thing. Fantastic. It's really the whole thing. It's really, um, I'm just trying to tell the truth, really be honest um, with the hope that my story can maybe help somebody else. Oh, it will. It, you know? It most definitely will the things that you've been through and and as you've said you know you you've stepped through doors that have been knocked down or or shoved out of the way you've you've knocked down plenty for the rest of us don't oh. don't ever think every single time you take the stage and you become you uh watching project runway and christian of course talks about the gown a lot. Oh, he does. <laughs> yeah. But he never did say, and I did it in two weeks. <laughs> no, he did it in nine days. But I will tell you that um, even Project Runway, and I don't know if it's Christian or your influence, are, are being so broad in their interpretation of mm -hmm. gender. It's mm -hmm. amazing. And, you know, we have you to thank for so much of that. Not wow. uh, not the least of which is your glorious voice and incredible acting. For you to be a supporter of the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus means the world to us. It, well, I can't wait to actually get there and be able to do a concert. Well, no, it's going to happen. Oh, you said it on, you said it on live TV. No, it's going to happen. Online. It's going to happen. I promise you, it's going to happen. We, we can't Yay. wait to share that experience with you. Yeah. I just think it's very important to support the arts in any way that we can because art is life. Mm -hmm. It's life for everybody. You know, I think the coronavirus, I think this, this moment really um, highlights that in such a beautiful way. You know, where is everybody going right now when they're stuck in the house? to the arts, right. whether it's crafting, whether it's television, whether it's film, whether it's crochet, whether it's whatever it is, you're going to the arts. So it's a necessity. It's the air we breathe. And you know, we have to, those of us who can, you know, we have to make sure that we take care of our children in this way and give them opportunities, you know, help them have those kinds of opportunities. You know, we have to pick up where the government has dropped the ball. We have to pick that up. We do. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Really, thank you. Yeah. And thanks for sharing your angels with us because I have felt <laughs> them all during this interview. So that's you're welcome. Thanks, thanks guys. Bye -bye. See you soon. Bye -bye.